You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button on our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for February 1st, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where it may be 30 below, but it's good for the crops. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. You know, it, you know, it, yeah. The the cold weather is good for the corn. Oh, the, the soybeans. <laughs> it, you know, it breaks up the soil. And then you bring up. Well, are you going to be able to sell soybeans? What with uh, President Stupid? And then then they go quiet. So, they go quiet. And they yeah. want to talk about country music. You know, <laughs> why would you stick around with a company like that when you can go home, plug in, and listen to the Professional Left podcast? Who has a new sponsor this week? Yes, we do. Uh, we spent a lot of time lining these people up. <laughs> uh, a lot of time courting, wooing, if you will. Bring them to the cornfield, showing them around. Uh, so we can proudly announce that our new fake sponsor is Laudable Books. The best audiobooks for only the best people. How do you get Laudable Books? You, you don't. don't. Laudable Books, no, you may not subscribe. <laughs> They're going for that elitist uh, yeah. reader no, no, kind of thing. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not for you. These are not for you. Move along. <laughs> another, another two or three audiobook services that I'm sure would be glad to have you. <laughs> not Laudable Books. Laudable Books are... Again, the best books for the best people. And really, you're not the best. <laughs> why do they advertise then? Never mind. That's why they're a fake sponsor. <laughs> to flaunt it, honey. To flaunt it. If you can't be, you know, what's the point in having an exclusive, you know, members only club if you don't tell everyone that they're not allowed to come? Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we got a lot to talk about today. and We do. Uh, we are actually recording much a little bit earlier than we usually do on a Friday. Yeah, about twenty, about twenty minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> I just, I just want you to know, you know, if if you get this podcast and all of a sudden Don Junior is indicted, it's not our fault. Don't look at us. Just to get past this whole weather situation, we did wind up with polar vortex and a bad furnace problem yeah. this week. Yeah. Yeah. We're very tired. <sighs> um, and and. That yeah, furnace went out, and uh, it was four hundred and sixty-seven dollars, I think, or something like that, to fix it. Furnace went out twice. Yeah, furnace went out twice. Yeah, that's the part that just like, oh, really? Really? You know, yeah. It was. It was. It was very, very cold. It was. It was in the thirty below range, twenty below range wind, with wind chill. Yeah, wind chills of insane below range, and this is the weather where you really have to say, we're not going out. We're not driving anywhere. We're not going to do anything. This is why we stocked up on, you know, fat back and hard tack and right. crackers. Because, <laughs> you know, no, we're not going to go out. No, we're not. And which, you know, makes the kids a little The teenagers crazy. always want to have a sleepover because they don't have school right. the next day. Why can't I, why can't you give me a ride to the mall? Right. Yeah. And they have that, that special bravery of, I can just go out in, you know, um, a, a light jacket in any weather uh -huh. because really, that's that. That's my look. Yeah. And this is the one where you you say no. You are absolutely going to put on hats and gloves and a coat, and because you have never experienced weather like this, and you're not going out. <laughs> By right. the way, you you're putting on hats and gloves and a coat, and you're staying home. <laughs> right. Because at one point, uh, middle child said she could see her breath upstairs, which was true. Yeah. With the furnace out, uh, she uh -huh. could see her breath in her room. Yeah. That it got yeah. bad. We had the gas fireplace, which we never use. It's just too expensive. Right. But we put that on and uh, mm -hmm. stayed in the living room and hunkered down, had the three cats in the bed with us and so forth. And I was going to do a GoFundMe uh, to help pay for our, you know, we only, we got a new furnace. And thank you to all of you who helped us yeah. pay for the new furnace 18 months Two years ago. ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, finding out that there's a part that went bad that had a one-year warranty and was 18 months old was a little disappointing. But yeah. Uh, they, anyway, and then finding out that maybe that part now. wasn't the problem. Yeah. Maybe that part oh, yeah. wasn't the problem. That was, and well, there were other problems in addition to that yes. part at the, if we're being generous with them yes. and, uh, certainly they came back, they came back they and came they fixed it and they're coming back again to make sure that everything's permanently set. They are good people. They do. They are reliable to come out and, uh, Things are working mm -hmm. today, and we're grateful that we have a furnace that works. Anyway, I yeah. was going to do a GoFundMe, and I went over to GoFundMe and noticed two people who are looking for money to 
support their insulin, <laughs> you know, to pay yeah. for insulin. Oh. And I'm like, come okay. on, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you know, charge it to visa and, and do what I can to pay it off. Cause it's, uh, right now, uh, tough times for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, well, the school was closed here for three days. Yeah, so three days. And, and no mail out. service. We didn't have mail yeah. service for several days. So mm -hmm. uh, cold. It was bad. Uh, yeah. But we warmed ourselves with uh, in the in the glow of both ciderism <laughs> all week. We did. we did. It was so warming and glowy and warming and glowy. <laughs> uh, yeah, the one thing that didn't go out was our sense of humor, mm -hmm. uh, our supply of alcohol. And because we... <laughs> And uh, the the Wi Fi, so yeah, we could warm ourselves by the in the warm and glow of Steve Schmidt turning out to be exactly who uh, certain members of the liberal blogging community, such as myself and Blue Gal, told you he was going to be all along. Wrote about it, warned you about it. This is this is a mercenary. Uh, he's going to sign up with the first both siderist douchebag who drags a dollar in front of him, and lo and behold, that's exactly what he did. Uh, we found out that Ron Fournier is not dead, which is very exciting. Um, Can we talk about of... that? Can we talk about that for a minute? Sure. Meet sure. the Press Daily. And there is there is <clears throat> Chuck Todd talking about Howard Schultz and how this is mm -hmm. proof that Democrats are in disarray and the future yes. of the Democratic debate and the Democratic Party and how they're going crazy over this independent wanting to talk independent stuff. And doesn't that just prove the extremism in the Democratic Party and and the future of debate and civility. And, and he was just sort of rambling on about trying to get to some centrist point based on Democrats being upset that a white guy, truly right wing, anti tax the rich billionaire, totally unaware of his privilege Mm -hmm. uh, had taken all the oxygen out of the room this week by saying, you know, I might run for president. And yeah. he's on and every show and he's on being interviewed everywhere and being given all this attention uh, mm -hmm. because he's rich and and, and promoting a and centrist he, position. Right. He, he's this is the sub the subheading. Would you, you care to tell people what the title of our podcast is? Our working title. <laughs> is? Well, if they're clicked on it, they already know. But the, the okay. title is when will it be the white guy's turn at the mic? Yeah. You know, it's a shame. It really is. I have a white mic. Rich and guys. Just, Why, when are they going to mm -hmm. get a microphone? And and that really is the outrage at this um, mm -hmm. is here's a guy preaching. Don't tax wealthy people. Don't do it. And Don't and it. we're just sick of it. And so. Mm -hmm. uh you and I are watching this, and I and I asked you. I'm I just couldn't couldn't pin down what Chuck Todd was trying to say. I knew he was Where's trying Chuck? to say centrism is the answer. Him? Yeah, but I was like, did he write this before he started talking, or did he think about yeah. it at all? Because it was just this sort well, of disjointed we, nonsense. And then we say of Rachel Maddow, <laughs> we say of Rachel Maddow. Rachel land the plane. Yeah, Rachel land the plane. Um, of, but at least she's talking Todd. about the same topic over and over right. again, right? Because she's, she's she's a good storyteller, but she circles and circles. Right. And Chuck Todd, we say, please just drive the truck off the cliff already, <laughs> because because we know where this is going. You're you're having this big rambling kind of incoherent roll, roll up to something, and then then for a moment the universe got very quiet. Very quiet, and and let's have Ron Fournier come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come tell us what's wrong with the universe and politics and, and shit. And I swear, you raised your arms to the air like you were Barbara Streisand at the end of On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. Yes. <laughs> and just, the well, universe is mine. <laughs> well, let me just say for you science fiction nerds out there, uh, there's a moment in Dune Messiah <laughs> 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 where Paul, I think it's in Dune Messiah, where Paul, yeah, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but Paul Maudib uh, uh, disappears at the end of the first story, and a prophet returns, and and he loses his sight, he loses his eyesight, uh, and the, a blind prophet returns, and it turns out it's him. It's wizened by the desert, and sort of you know, not we're not sure who he is. We know who he is, but his his prophecy, his prophetic vision is so accurate, he no longer requires actual eyes to see anything. Ah, okay. Because his vision of the universe is so precise. Uh, and terrifying because he sees where everything is going and it scares the shit out of him. And his goal is to knock it off the path to, to prevent the terrible thing that's coming from coming. But that is really sort of weirdly how it felt. It's like, of course, this is, this is, has the, I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, did they ever fix the furnace? Is this what hypothermia is like? 
when you, <laughs> you start imagining that everything is so fucking predictable that you can do it literally with your yeah, eyes you closed. Can and Ron Fournier. You you watch the TV and listen to Chuck Todd and thought. Ron Fournier will appear, and he does, yes. right? Yeah. It's like, it is like Beetlejuice. Yeah, you know, you yeah. say both sides three times, and boom, Ron Fournier will show up to start talking to you about the corrupt duopoly. Well, and I want to thank just, you, Drift Glass, because you really yeah. helped me this week with your, <laughs> uh, you know, concentration and insistence over the years that both sides is what the media wants to talk about. It's all they want to talk and about. Yep. I was trying to find an angle for t- talking about why Noah Rothman's book got two full mornings on Morning yeah. Joe. When he is so fucking bad. When he's just a privileged little twerp. And yeah. I couldn't figure it out until I heard him say, you know, this is an argument that Black Lives Matter and white nationalists make. <laughs> Exactly. Like, and it's like, bing, ding, bing, ding, bing, bing, bing. Yes, right. Yep. It's like he got two mornings to pimp his book on yes. Morning Joe, and they're going to have a roundtable yep. discussion on race and equality. And no, we're going to listen to Noah Rothman uh, as if he's sitting on a dorm room floor at three in the morning. You know, man, yeah. uh, the white guy, the white guy is just as oppressed as anybody, man. That's right, man. And, you, know, you know it's true. <laughs> and and putting it in, you know, what we really need to do is get rid of tribalism and think mm-hmm. about the individual, man. The individual. Individual. You know what? You know what? You know what? You know what society is made up of? <laughs> like the cell. Have you ever looked at your hand, man? <laughs> it's cells. It's all cells, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what and it was like. that's what and it was it, like. And yet, because it's what he's really saying is – don't call the Republican Party racist. Right. That was that's... what was behind all of that. And it, in order to do is. that, you have to put this patina of uh, philosophy. You know, look at all these mm-hmm. great philosophers and what they thought about tribal behavior and behavioralism yes. and a whole bunch of isms t- thrown in there. And yeah. it was the non-white people on the panel that were having none of it. <laughs> Right. Well, but it, and here's the point. And here's here's how you know you're living in someone else's narrative. Mm-hmm. And that there is no such thing as a true meritocracy, and you, it, certainly not in, in the media. Because Noah Rothman studied the, like, asshole smirk face uh, Rich oh, Lowry yeah. school of. He looked, if you took Tucker Carlson's dumbest, smirkiest asshole looking down his nose at you little people – and the nasally whiny kind of, well, this is why you coloreds don't understand what uh-huh, we're talking uh-huh. about. And put it in, in a 12-year-old kid who's who's not shaving on a regular basis yet. And give him a really important job and title. That's what Noah Rothman is. Except Noah Rothman is also uh, Matthew Continetti, yeah. who is also Bill Crystal, who is also, um, uh, well, th- there's a long list. and I'm not going to bore you with all of them. But they're all the same guy. They're like various life stages of the same uh, privileged white prick who is caught in the middle of a culture war that he started and he thought he was going to win. And now the people that he decided to shit on are are punching back. He doesn't know what to do. But here's the thing. He was publicly undressed on the Morning Joe show. He got his ass handed to him. His dumb book got taken apart. But here's the thing. It doesn't fucking matter. Because he'll be back because he's on a list somewhere. And when you need that privileged, smirking white guy asshole, he's on Fox News. He's on CNN. He's fucking everywhere. And it doesn't matter. It it made me wonder. It made me ask the question, whose son-in-law is he? Oh, exactly. Literally. We know who Matthew Cottonetti is, his father-in-law is. It's Bill Crystal. And that's why Matthew Cottonetti, who has no talent, no ability, absolutely no business being in front of a camera, gets a reserved seat. There's a club, and and here's and the club tells itself one story. That's what makes uh, what we do, in my mind, important. Because you will never understand why we lose these arguments until you understand that the were, facts don't matter. This is a war of story versus story, of narrative mm-hmm. versus narrative. Republicans are trapped inside of a narrative they cannot and will not escape from. They need to protect themselves from the outside world with an impregnable narrative about colored people and ladies who are mouthy and liberals and blah, 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 
who are all conspiring against them. And the result of their conspiracy, our conspiracy, is every bad thing that ever happened to them. And, and facts, you, you can argue with them facts all day long, and they'll just bounce the fuck off. They don't care about that. They're stuck inside their story. The story that the media tells is that both sides are bad, that every problem that ever exists in this country is the result of the extremes on both sides, patently, verifiably untrue, which you can sit there for two minutes and disassemble right in front of them, which is why they do usually do not allow people inside the golden circle who will do the one thing that needs to be done, which is pull the pin on that grenade and say, this is bullshit. Both sides is bullshit. And every now and then, during the depths of the Trump administration, mm -hmm. during the worst days, you can see Chuck Todd edging up to the line of saying, you know, it isn't both sides. And you can just see him like in agony saying that because, you know, somewhere in some executive suite, some person who has control over his job is watching. Yep. And the minute he crosses that line, there's a buzzer that goes off and it says, have Mr. Todd come up to his boss's office. Now, Chuck, we've explained to you the reason you get to sit there and have this enormous salary and have this huge influence and have a nice house and a pretty wife and a big car and you can lecture at schools is because your job is to fucking sit there and ask Hugh Hewitt about both sides. Oh, and bring you on just mentioned Hugh Hewitt. Did you read Hugh Hewitt's column this morning? No, I saw Hugh Hewitt on Meet the Press oh, over the weekend. Okay. They well, squeezed him between Kevin McCarthy <laughs> and Tom Brokaw. Well, he had a column in our paper this morning, too, talking about immigration. The immigration grand bargain, Driftglass. I saw that the column existed, and my eyes just wouldn't stay on it. <laughs> it refused to stay. I said, why would I, why would I read it when I know what it says already? Well, he I wants exactly the immigration. He wants a grand bargain on immigration, and he wants the extremes on <laughs> Both sides to be cut out of the debate and let's get reasonable pe people together because the extremes mm -hmm. on both sides. Right. And it really was a uh, sleight of hand. And and this was this to me was what was interesting about it was that wart on the argument that is an anomaly to the both sides argument. There was a razor in the apple pointed right at Ann Coulter. Yeah. Who she who is being cut out of this because. Uh, Rush Limbaugh will will go with the flow eventually sure. and support a Republican president over a Democrat every time. Ann Coulter is talking about primarying Trump over this. And well, this she's is about to be, mm -hmm. you know, cut out of polite, quote unquote, society because she's wedded herself to the wall. He actually used the term in his column uh, amnesty. Scre those people screaming amnesty, uh, let them scream, he says. Yeah. Yeah. So she, this is a sleight of hand to dump Coulter from the immigration debate. And, and what, what those of us who have watched these people over decades mm -hmm. do their thing know in our bones is that there's no amount of, I will never cross this line. Donald Trump is dead to me now. Yeah. Bullshit that they can say that they won't undo next week because their core audience are fucking lobotomized. They're right. they're farm animals. Ann Coulter can say whatever the fuck she wants this week. Yeah. And and Hugh Hewitt can cut her out of the will and, and disinherit her. And next month they'll be the best of friends. Yes, right. Because the and people, on a panel the, together at Politicon. Because they're, right. <laughs> they're, they're, they are on the same team. The, ta the team of, as they used to say, I believe in the 60s, uh, uh, fleecing, greasing, and decreasing yeah. the morons who watch Fox News and who vote for Donald Trump. That's the goal. The goal is to separate those people from their votes and their money as much as possible. And so all of the people at the top of this pyramid, and I'm, I'm including Rick Wilson, who knows this, uh, um, uh, Steve Schmidt, who knows this, everyone who works in Republican politics knows that Republican base voters are reprogrammable meatheads. That's how the party continues to exist. And, and so it doesn't matter what the knife fight is at the top. It's always an argument over who gets to point the morons in what direction. But it's never in the direction of the good of the country. It's never in the direction of the good of the American people. It's never in the direction of anything progressive. It's, and and the end of the day, no matter how much they may bloody each other up for, you know, in, in professional wrestling terms, they'll always end up arm in arm blaming the liberals mm -hmm. for their scars and bruises and every bad thing that happened. That's because and that's why you have the both sider narrative. The both sider narrative is the is is the rope around the ring. You know, it's it's what keeps the fight inside. No matter how bad things get, you can always, always blame the fucking liberals. You can always blame, whether it's completely for every bad thing that happens, if you're a conservative, 
or half of every bad thing if you're Chuck Todd. People wonder who Howard Schultz's constituency is. It's, it's David Brooks. That's it. Yeah. The Beltway. And, and they rolled out the fucking red carpet for him. And when he announced that Steve Schmidt was his new man, uh, I, I wrote a whole post on deconstructing the word disappoint. <laughs> disappointed. Yeah. So, so many liberals are so disappointed. Oh, my God, Steve, I'm so disappointed. How could you, Steve? And I'm like, this is the person you know who's dated 20 shitty people in a row. and and the, But the 21st is different, blue gal. Yeah. I can change him. And, and you're like, he's the same asshole you dated before and a million times before. He's the same abusive prick. And he's putting on a front for two, three months. And at the end of that time, you're going to wake up in a bathtub with your kidney gone, your money gone, wondering how, what happened? I believe, no, dumbass, learn. Liberals, fucking learn. These people are coming for you. They rely on the fact that you continue to want to give people a second yep. chance yep. and believe in redemption, which is a good impulse to sucker you into believing that they actually have changed. They know they can rely on you to say, oh, just give him a second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth chance. Because you know why? Because he went on TV and said, Donald Trump is a poopy head. So now he's in the tribe. Now he's part of my group. No, he's not. He's taking your money. He's crashing on your couch. He's ripping you off until the first train out of liberal town to Centerville passes this direction. He'll hop and he'll be gone. And you'll be sitting there wondering what, what happened. And at that point, as I wrote in my post today, please don't come crying yep. on my shoulder. Well, and and because let's face it, he it's not just that he went to work for Howard Schultz. It's that he told he advised oh. Howard Schultz to go after Democrats. This is Absolutely. this is a Republican policy driven economic mm-hmm. model that Steve Schmidt knows he can make money off of. And what yeah. and whether or not he believes in anything, he is he and, and others like him are very well spoken, have the gift of the gab, are able to go on TV and do a really righteous rant. I get it. It feels good mm-hmm. sure. to listen to a righteous sure. rant. Uh and there there were Smith a righteous rant yeah, from someone know. a righteous rant from someone who used to throw right. rocks at you. Right. That's what makes it juicy. Oh, he used to hate me and call me names, but now he yeah. likes me and calls me pretty. Well, no, he knows you're dumb enough to fall for that. That's right. what he's doing. And and again don't don't cry on my shoulder because my shoulder is very sore from pushing this rock up this mountain for the last 10 years. Honestly. So please stop falling for stupid Republican tricks. Hey, Drift Class, we got a letter this week. We did. Uh, from Trudy. And we want to thank Trudy for her letter. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, she has a bone to pick with us. And I think it's a, a good bone. I told her, I replied to her and I said, I knew I was going to get in trouble last week when I said what I said. And uh, sure enough, we got a letter from her about it. So uh, I, I want to read it on the air. I always enjoy your podcasts, Trudy writes. Can we stop and right there? The, just yeah. stop right there. Stop no, right I mean, just there. literally stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> the end. No. I always enjoy your podcasts and agree with most of what you have to say. But your dismissive mention of some guy from West Bend or wherever, Indiana, Entering the presidential circus has me flummoxed. I grew up in South Bend, Indiana, home to Notre Dame University. When I was a kid in the 60s, it was also home to Studebaker and Bendix, which were giant employers that supported a burgeoning middle class and lots of other employers selling stuff to that middle class. South Bend is traditionally is a traditionally Democratic island in a sea of Hoosier red. Joe Donnelly, the one-term Democratic senator who was defeated in the last midterm, even though he desperately tried to camouflage himself as a Democratic name only, is from Granger, which is essentially a suburb of South Bend. Now, Pete Buttigieg, or Mayor Pete, you're allowed to call him Mayor Pete, he is 37 years old. He's a Harvard graduate, Rhodes Scholar, Naval Reservist, deployed to Afghanistan for seven months during his first term as mayor. He was reelected with 80% of the vote. He married his husband last summer. My mother and sister who still live in South Bend assure me that he is beloved there. Unfortunately, Pete is not positioned to move up in Indiana politics. Governor is out, Senate is out, even U.S. representative is extremely unlikely. Howard Dean, who I still respect, report, supported him for DNC chair but he was a voice in the wilderness. 
you are the second liberal site I have seen make fun of him this week, and I wrote to them as well. I am particularly disappointed in you, Driftglass, who moan constantly about being ignored out there in flyover country and not taken seriously. Mayor Pete is trying, in the only way he has open to him, to become a national voice for the Democratic Party. He has proven himself to be an able administrator in a largest rush belt city that has been on a downward trajectory since the 70s. He is young, energetic, and could be for the LGBTQ community what Obama was for the African-American community. This is his chance to at least become known to other Democrats, so maybe they will mention him without making fun of his Maltese surname or his backwater hometown. I hope you will consider hearing his ideas before dismissing him out of hand. Thanks. I know you will do your due diligence on Mayor Pete before deciding to join the old white men in the party and blocking him from contributing to the Democrats' future. Signed, Trudy. Okay. Well, thank you, Trudy. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't know any of that about Mayor Pete. I feel um, properly chastened. Yep. Good. <laughs> um, um, you and I talked a lot about this letter after we got we it. We did. We did. Um, that were news junkies and had never heard of him before. Right. And that's what uh, one one web series called Piss Poor Staff Work. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if people who uh, write for Crooks and Liars and uh, blog every day for Democratic principles – um, have never heard of you and you want a serious run at the White House or a serious run for any national office, including DNC chair, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and those, you know, I don't want to be snooty about knowing more than other people because that's not my point. My point is I'm more interested than a lot of people in politics. And I, I'm online all day long, every day for work to find out what the Democratic Party is doing, figure out what the issues are, et cetera. And granted, this is a a mayor, not a national politician. He's a mayor. Mm -hmm. That he's got to start somewhere. Uh, I get that. He he can't be surprised that people say Pete who. I mean, that's not that's right. what they're going to say. Right. So and, uh, and well, and in all fairness, um, people with unusual names are never elected president. <laughs> uh, which is why, as much as I like Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, as much as I respect the fact that he's from the Midwest, I wouldn't give that young man much of a chance. Um, uh, and but what, here's what Obama did. He gave an electrifying speech at the uh, Democrat National Convention in 2004, set himself up to run. And, and but he he had tried to, to come up through the congressional route and had gotten, you know, blocked yep. uh, by local politics. He was knocked out of the race by a, <laughs> the, the local um uh, the local politicians who who had told him it was his turn, he could come up and then pull the rug out from under him and so forth. So, um, and believe me, uh, as a Midwesterner with a funny name, uh, who has been knocking on the door of even liberal um, supporters, liberal allies who are who have a much 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 larger platform than we do, and are constantly um, overlooked, I am completely sympathetic with Mayor Pete's position. Mm -hmm. Um. And he, I can sympathize with the idea of him trying to get into the race to have people know him for right. the next time, the next time, next time. So I'm not going to say a, another word about him other than um, I wish him luck. Mm -hmm. uh, his record sounds awesome. Well, and, and, and the Democratic debates start in June of this yeah. year. So mm -hmm. for him to be on a debate stage and get his name out there and and perhaps get into Congress, you don't know what his goals are ultimately, but to have a national name as a gay rights advocate, uh, sitting Democrat mayor, uh, who's going to talk about all of the issues. Uh, you know, I don't have any problem with him no. being part of that discussion or, and, and getting, and allowing himself then to get known. Uh, and here's, well, here's, can I bring up one more thing? Yeah. Uh, he's running as a Democrat, right? He's not running a vanity third party candidacy. No, he's not. Yeah. To try to bring us to the center because yeah. the extremes are that you know, if he's running as a Democrat in the Democratic primary, mm -hmm. announcing he wants to be president and nominee of the Democratic Party. Right. Check, check, check. He checks a lot of boxes right. for me. That's great. Right. Um I still think, you know, he's realistically he's up against um 
he's up against Yankees murderers row. There's right. he's not going to get through. But I respect what he's doing. I will continue to mispronounce his name. Um, <laughs> I'm going to call him Mayor Pete from now on. That's Mayor easy. Pete sounds fine. <laughs> yeah. um, I thank you, Trudy, for setting yes. us straight. Yes, definitely. We, he, and here's the thing. When we say we do appreciate the letters from you and hearing from you, we really do. Yeah. We hear from you. A lot of the times what we hear are great job, keep it up. And here's some sort of thing you didn't know, which is terrific. Uh, we, we were set straight last week about the use of the word tabling yep. uh, across the pond in here. We really, even though even though I'm a poor correspondent and and it takes a long time for me to get back to some people, I really do read everything. Mm -hmm. And when and we while we can't read every critique of every mistake we make because that would be literally a separate podcast, <laughs> um, uh, it, we do take it very personally. And it, if it's not a death threat, um, we'll read it and we'll take it to heart. And th you just you're right. We should be chastened. We were wrong. We apologize. Mayor Pete, if you want to come on our podcast. <laughs> We'd love to have you on our podcast, Mayor you're, Pete. Hey. You're right across the border in Indiana. And I'm finally, I'm really sorry you're stuck in Indiana, man. Um, <laughs> there's there's a way out. It's called <laughs> I-80. Uh, you just hop on it and you can be over here in, in, two, in, in two shakes. Hey, uh, by I the need way, to tell you how much of a uh, narcissism of small differences there is. Oh, among oh, God, Midwestern yes. states like Iowa mm -hmm. and and Indiana and Illinois are always fighting each other. Yeah. Well, let me let me say something nice about Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> other than the fact that Parks and Rec was set there. Yeah. Um, Ivy Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, Ivy Tech is the community college system, more or less. There, it's, I, I'm not sure if I have it exactly right, but they do. They did last time I checked, and I've been at it for a couple of years now. They did a really splendid job of getting people trained into middle-class voc ed type jobs that I think are very important. I think are honorable work and they're, and, and they're terrific and, and so forth. Indiana has done a much, much, much better job than Illinois of harnessing its community college system to turn out people for really important uh, manufacturing jobs, transportation jobs, logistics jobs, STEM type jobs um, that lead to bigger and better things than Illinois has. And that's all down to them. All right. Uh, the podcast sent me to Davos this week. I had a really good time. You know, yes. I, I had some spa time. I went on a couple panels. You know, it was great. Shh, shh, no, no. Remember, the furnace broke. That's the story. <laughs> we're sticking with the story. The, with the story that we were huddled the, by the gas fireplace. Look out two rooms away. Oh, she's in the West Wing, actually. <laughs> the West the Wing of our palatial she can't, she can't see the air quotes. Remember the furnace, honey. <laughs> the furnace. That's the story we're sticking with. No, I did not go to Davos, but I did watch clips from Davos, and I wanted to do a shout out to Rutger Bregman. Yeah, uh, he was at he was at Davos, and yes. uh, he is one of these uh, economist historian types who uh, argues uh, for minimum uh, basic income and really yeah. some utopian ideas about the economy. Uh, mm -hmm. He made a lot of people mad at D at Davos this he week. <laughs> Uh, well, and he, can I, yeah. I just want to mention one thing. Mm -hmm. We talk about a lot of telling truth to power on right, this podcast. Right. And we also talk a lot about our level of frustration that the powerful will not let us within a thousand miles of them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to tell truth to power to them, especially in front of an audience. Right. That's really where it right, counts. Right. Uh, they'll just lie to you behind closed doors. But in front of an audience, it's really important to bring your A game. If you ever get the opportunity to step into the bigs, bring your A game, be ready to take them down. Um, that's what he did. That's what he did. He, he, he went to them in their, in their place of power. In their backyard. Yep. She, he was on a panel with, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get her name wrong, but it's, uh, Winnie Bianmia, who is the executive director of Oxfam. And also, uh, who else was on the panel with him? Do you remember? Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall was on the panel with him. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and they were talking about this panel was about economic inequality. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're supposed to have there's a bunch of billionaires there who are looking to mm -hmm. work with non-governmental organizations to stop poverty, feed the poor, help refugees, mm -hmm. clean water initiatives, you know, things that are all very good things to do. Uh, yes. On the other hand, it's it was really important that this particular panel went completely off script. Uh, yes. And what Rutger Bregman said was 
Um, look, this is my first time at Davos. I'll read the quote. This is my first time at Davos. I find it quite bewildering, to be honest. 1,500 private jets have flown in here to hear say, Sir David Attenborough talk about how we're wrecking the planet. Mm -hmm. I hear people talking about the language of participation and justice and equality and transparency. And, I mean, no one here raises the issue of tax avoidance. Exactly. The rich not paying their fair share. I feel as if I'm at a firefighters conference and no one is allowed to mention water. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. during Shep the kid. panel, mm-hmm. <laughs> the former CEO of Yahoo, who has a Charles Dickens character name, he's Ken Goldman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a big curly mustache. And he but... stood up and said that the panel was too one-sided. Right. And we shouldn't just be talking about taxes. Why can't we be talking about uh, clean water initiatives and blah, you know all of the philanthropy and all the good things that billionaires right. are doing with their money. Right? Because there's one panel of the 200 here that's talking about this. Right. This is and, that's it. This is the one panel where yeah. this this went off script and and blew up. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, the director of Oxfam. Uh, again, I'm going to say her name wrong. It's Winnie Bianyama, I believe, is how she says it. Uh, she talked to. She said, "Let me tell you something about the United States of America." <laughs> Strap in. <laughs> we are an Oxfam. We have the United States of America on our radar because there are women working at chicken plants processing chicken who have to wear diapers to work because they are not allowed bathroom breaks. And Ken Goldman was saying, you know, you're, this is so one side you're talking about taxes, but unemployment worldwide is at the lowest right. level. Jobs ever. are up, honey. Jobs, jobs are up. Poverty is down. Right. Jobs are up. Access to clean drinking water is, is improving. We're doing good things. The economy is, the worldwide economy is doing good things. So stop blaming us rich people for not paying taxes because right. there are things that are better. That was his argument. And she said, it's not job numbers. It's the type of jobs that people are forced to take and the workers lack of power in the workplace that matters. And uh, this dovetails nicely with something that uh, Sherrod Brown said this week. And uh, I find it, I don't know if you find this hilarious drift glass, but I find it hilarious that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gets shrieking and wailing on Fox news about she's a socialist. She's a socialist. She's a socialist. Right. Where, Old tweety socialists like Sherrod Brown, and you and I know about a hundred of people like this around yes. the country, Who, right? By the way, married way above his station. In he did. Life. Oh, just so we're clear. You wouldn't know anything about that, Drift no, Glass. No, no. <laughs> we have a club, Blue Gal. <laughs> we're, we're the, it's the luckier than we deserve club. So the luckier than you deserve club. Exactly. Well, thank you for that, Drift Glass. You always say that, and I'm always pleased by that. But anyway, uh, Sherrod Brown made the case that uh, his campaign is not about some sort of philosophy of progressivism. It's about working people and justice. Yeah. And making that same kind of argument about jobs, that it's not, we have to have dignity to our work. And so I find it hilarious that, uh, you know, people kind of look at him as white guy senator you know, from a from a Rust Belt state who's making a populist argument, not a socialist argument, right? right? But, he, right. <laughs> but let's face it, he's making a Marxist argument. And, and, well, and the argument they're all making is, hey, let's, since the rich have gotten insanely rich, mm-hmm. since they have hoarded more wealth than you can begin to imagine, mm-hmm. why don't we take their nostalgia of the, uh, of the teabaggers seriously? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And take us back to a time in the 50s when President Dwight David Eisenhower had a top marginal tax rate of 91%. No, no, let's be even more civilized than that. Let's bring it down to 70%. That seems about right. 70%. Those were the good old days. All the people who are nostalgic for the good old days of the 50s and 60s are nostalgic for a time when you had excellent public education, publicly funded education, a top marginal tax rate of between 70 and 90%, and uh, unions. A third of the workforce are unionized. Everything that you right. just said, mm-hmm. apart from the marginal tax rate, I would add the phrase for white people. Yeah, oh, absolutely. For white people, no, no, no. For white no. people, for white people. That's the difference. 
That's a, that's how you get white rural people to vote against their economic interests exactly. time and time again is it might go to the browns all the stuff and, that made yeah. us made our middle class life comfortable we might have to share with people who aren't like us right. and so it's worth being poor and bitter just to make sure they can't have any of it yeah and we yep. need to we need to blow that wide open yeah. we need to to put nothing but sunlight on that fact yes. and the more sunlight we put on that i think the more you'll get uh, a turnaround. I'm not trying to, con- I realize you can't argue with these people or make any uh, sort of debate of on facts with a lot mm-hmm. of Fox Newsicans, as we call them. Yeah. But I think if you can shine sunlight on the reason that Republicans get what they want over and over again and screw you, white America, screw rural white America, mm-hmm. it's because they've convinced you that it's the blacks or the browns or the Hispanics or who everybody else Who's going to steal from you when actually you're stealing from yourself? It's it's how you destroyed yeah. the progressive movement, which yep. was turn white rural farmers against black rural farmers mm-hmm. and make them mm-hmm. fight on behalf of rich rich landowners. Yep. That's how you get. That's how you destroy a progressive movement. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so clear that sunlight is the best uh, disinfectant to this discussion. Yeah. I am. Uh, I can't get anything but excited by the fact that there's going to be 20 people running the Democratic primaries. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think every time you hear Democrats in disarray, what you're hearing is, oh, my God, grownups are having an actual policy debate over what should be done to the country to make it better. That's a good thing. You should have a spirited debate over what you want to do, what your national priorities are, where you want to spend your money, how much you want to spend, and so forth. That's what grown-up politics should sound like. There should be a debate between Republicans and Democrats over these issues, but there isn't because the Republican Party is dead. Mm -hmm. So all the real policymaking, all the real thinking, all the smart people are in one party, and they're having a big disagreement about this and that. It's a family fight. I think that's a terrific thing. If you're not in the Democratic Party, shut up. Right. Period. Period. I don't want to hear from you. If you're not in my party, if you haven't joined the party that's actually having a policy discussion, I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from you, Howard Schultz. Don't care. You're in the race to spoil it, to get your your stupid vanity project up and running, to raise your – because some idiot on your board told you you'd be a great president. And you are so surrounded by people who are sycophants who tell you everything is great and you're the smartest person in the world that you have no fucking idea how much Cheerios cost. Drift class. You and I are and anyway, catching up with our months. latest mm-hmm. catch up uh, show, which most people listening to this podcast have probably watched already. But we are watching Rake and we're in season two because yes. we, we go very slow. <laughs> yes. But uh, <laughs> last night we watched the episode in season uh-huh. two where they're trying to find a way to name the male reproductive organ in court. With a very uptight old yes. white judge who doesn't want you to say penis, right? Um, and <laughs> right, his his wife his wife has a name for it in, <laughs> yeah. the, in the hygienic oh, the what area. Not. But... <laughs> the what not? Yeah. Uh, so today, Senator John Kennedy, uh, who my colleague Carolee says uh, he Kennedy likes to get attention with his folksy ways, but he's really just an asshole. Uh, but he he did say. That uh, Nancy Pelosi could call Trump's wall a wang doodle if she wanted to, and and you said, and then cut it off. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, and then cut it off, and, and run around the Capitol with an overhead going. Wee, yeah, wee, wee. yeah, and and yeah. I want to give his ass. credit to the yeah. House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee and their blue check mark Twitter account. Yes. Who said on Twitter with their blue check mark being the official House Homeland Security Committee, you can tell Democrats are in charge. Five point seven billion dollars is a lot of taxpayer money to waste on a wang doodle. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're going to call it a wang doodle from now on. If you prefer a more clinical definition, it's uh, Trump surrogate. <laughs> it yeah. is a Trump surrogate yeah. penis. That's yeah. the point. Uh, Drift class, we should do a news roundup. Number one, I'll do. I'll start off. The Trump-McConnell government shutdown lasted 35 days and might be shut down again in two weeks. That's right. 
And the Trump McConnell shutdown cost the country roughly twice what Trump was demanding for his surrogate penis wall or wang doodle, if you will. It cost the economy $11 billion with an estimated $3 billion in economic activity permanently lost. And 31 percent of voters, uh, well, you know, polls are polls, but 31 percent of voters support shutting the government down again over Trump's surrogate penis wall or his wang doodle while 58% oppose another government shutdown generally. If the government shuts down again, a combined 54% would blame Trump and Republicans, while 33%, and we know who they are, would once again blame congressional Democrats. Well, that 31 to 33% sure is consistent, isn't it? They're really consistent across all time and space. <laughs> They're always the same. They always think the same, and we know who they are. The National Association of Business Economics found that one, the $1.5 trillion tax cut package had no major impact on businesses, capital investment or hiring plans. Yes. I I think there were some people out there who had predicted this would happen. I think they're called mm-hmm. liberals. Yes. And economists. Yeah. And, and economists. Basically yes. any, anyone who knows math. Uh, this one should be followed collectively by everyone in our audience going. <laughs> oh, this next one. All yes. Right. Yes. Nancy Pelosi has finally extended an invitation to President Stupid to give his State of the Union address on February 5th. Drum roll, please. Stacey Abrams will give the Democratic response. <laughs> and we have to make sure yes. that Stacey Abrams' ratings are through yeah. the roof compared to Crushes. Donald Trump. So Crushes. watch yeah. Twitter. Make sure when she goes on, that's when you turn on your TV. Yeah. yeah. Roger Stone pleaded not guilty to witness tampering, obstruction of justice, and lying to Congress. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Shocking. Billionaire Republican hobgoblins Sheldon and Miriam Adelson donated half a million dollars to a legal defense fund set up to help the legal costs of Trump aides who were involved in the Mueller investigation. The Adelsons were also the largest contributors to GOP political campaigns and committees, making more than $100 million in donations to Republican candidates. Thank you, Citizens United. Sarah Huckabee Sanders said that God wanted Donald Trump to become president and she was not immediately struck by lightning. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of make that yeah. gives me a crisis of faith right there. Yeah. Pairing <laughs> those two together is kind of fun. You know, uh, the, the Adelson gave the GOP a hundred million dollars, but it was God yeah. who wanted Donald Trump right, to be president. Right. And that's why he's, does that mean God wanted Barack Obama to be president? I, I don't know. Uh-huh. Are we sure about uh-huh. that? Um, two House Democrats called on acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney to revoke Jared Kushner's top secret security clearance, neener, 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 just to keep it in the headlines, just to keep the conversation going. Kamala Harris formally launched her Democratic bid for president and had she had 20,000 people in Oakland, California at her uh, rally, and she seemed to have a lot of fun there. Mm-hmm. And Cory Booker dropped the hot single. Uh, in which he announced his bid for his pre- the presidency also in 2020. Again, let a thousand flowers bloom. That's what I yep. say. Yep, and his video has is winning all of the awards. You know, it's a mm-hmm. good opening introductory video to who he is. Okay, uh, don't send me email about how he's a corporate Wall Street guy. I get it. I know that. Thank you. <laughs> Um, can I read you something from Ely Mistal? Sure. Just came across, I, I want him. It's, it's, I want his brain yeah. if I don't have yours. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I'll take that as the compliment, which I'm sure you intend it to be. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but th- he's a funny guy and he's very, really smart. Very and funny. we just, we just like listening to him talk. But it's, this is just a tweet of his that came across the transom as we were doing this that fits in well here. It's an imaginary conversation between a liberal and him, Ely Mistal. Liberal, I don't trust Harris on criminal justice reform. Me, okay, well, Booker has been out in front on reform for years. Liberal, but he's in the pocket of Wall Street. Me, okay, then you're for Warren. Liberal, she's so unlikable. Me, uh, ellipses. Liberal, I like Biden or Brown or Beto or Bernie. Me, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Got it. What do all those have in common? When oh, are the yeah. white guys going to get a microphone? <laughs> when finally is it white guys' turn? When, blue gal, when? 45 presidents. That's when. Yeah. Speaking of rich white guys. Yeah. Michael Bloomberg warned that there is no way an independent presidential candidate can win. And it would ensure running as one would ins- only ensure Donald Trump's reelection. Yeah. So, Steve Schmidt, I hope you can sleep well at night on that big pile of money that you're getting from Howard Schultz. Three Republican senators introduced a plan to repeal the federal estate tax. Fewer than how many wealthy Americans, families would pay this tax annually? Guess how many? Just guess. 200 million, 20 million, 
200,000? No, 2,000 Americans pay this tax. It's the, it's the wealthy, wealthy, wealthiest 0.01% I think yeah, I think I I think I edited your piece wrong. It's two thousand of the wealthiest Americans are eligible to pay this tax if someone yeah. dies. Yeah. It's yeah. it's Walmart. You know, that's pretty much yeah. what we're talking about. That's pretty much it. And so three guess which party senators decided that we need to repeal that tax immediately. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that's not gonna have a good uh hearing in the House of Representatives. No. It'd be fun though. I'll listen to that. I'll be live blogging. Yeah. <laughs> The debate on that. (laughs) Trump's reelection campaign plans to sue former White House staffer Cliff Sims for violating his nondisclosure agreement. Yeah, that's going to be a fun court case. Uh, Meanwhile, the Trump creeps committee to reelect the president uh, have raised seven million dollars and spent twenty three million dollars in the last quarter, according to their FEC filing. And uh, there's a lot of people going. Hmm. <laughs> about that, the difference in those numbers is wider than ordinarily uh, filed at this time in a campaign. Hmm. Uh, speaking of Donald Trump, he once again used his platform as president of the United States to dismiss climate change as a hoax and called for global warming to come back fast as the polar vortex rolled across our house and killed our furnace. Trump called any bipartisan committee plan to avoid a government shutdown a waste of time if it doesn't include a border wall or tallywhacker. (laughs) A wall is once again a wall and not peaches or slats. Nancy Pelosi replied that there is not going to be any wall money in the legislation. (laughs) Nancy wants to shut the government. I'm going to have to declare an emergency. Uh, U.S. intelligence chiefs, chiefs pretty much across the board contradicted Donald Trump's claims about pretty much everything. North Korea, Iran, ISIS, everything. And contradicted in this context is a nice way of saying that Trump is lying about really important shit that could get a lot of people killed. Mitch McConnell called a bill to make Election Day a federal holiday a power grab by Democrats. He said it would victimize taxpayers by making it easier to vote. He needs uh, to lose. He needs to go to hell. Mm-hmm. He needs to go mm-hmm. bodily into a lake of fire forever. Um, 62% of Americans believe that Trump knew that people like Roger Stone, Michael Cohen, Paul Manafort, and others tried to conceal information from federal investigators. Half of America believes that Trump personally asked people around him to provide misleading information about his business or Russian interference. Those are getting into Watergate numbers. Yeah. Not early Watergate numbers. Watergate summer numbers. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. Sarah Huckabee Sanders claimed that Roger Stone's arrest, once again, has nothing to do with the president. (laughs) Right. And certainly nothing to do with the White House. Yeah. Trump, meanwhile, tweeted, greatest witch hunt in the history of our country. No collusion, no collusion, no collusion. Yeah. It it is the greatest witch hunt. It is the very, it's the greatest witch hunt of all. And and I'm I'm so looking forward to... (laughs) Catching that witch. We've yeah. <laughs> got so well, many witches, of, yeah. There's a bucket of water with your name on it, pal. Um, Trump publicly attacked the U.S. intelligence community, claiming they're being, quote, extremely passive and naive and suggesting his intel chiefs need to, quote, go back to school because they are wrong because uh-huh. he's the smartest man who ever lived and knows everything about everything, blue gal. And all those people who spent their careers studying intelligence and studying spy work and working their way through the career and learning about the world – are idiots and don't know anything. Federal immigration officials at a Texas detention facility are force-feeding six immigrants using nasal feeding tubes. ICE says 11 detainees at an El Paso facility have been on a hunger strike, some for more than a month. Yeah. there's all Just as a a general um, announcement, there are a whole bunch of really important stories Mm -hmm. that are happening just below the headline level. Yeah. Uh, that are just not getting any attention because Donald Trump is such a is such a an existential disaster for this yep. country. Um, for example, if you're hiring dinner speakers, N- Nikki Haley is currently charging two hundred thousand dollars a pop. Plus, you have to give her the use of a private plane. Yeah, well, you know, all those people who were mad at Hillary for doing that uh, might want to ask, ask themselves uh, what the market rate is for Nikki Haley. There you go. Yeah, self-reflection, not going to do it. (sighs) Trump met Putin at the G20 summit in November without a U.S. translator, note taker, or staff member present. Melania Trump was there. I'm sure she was taking notes, uh, as well as Putin's own translator. By the way, Putin speaks English. 
Trump does not yes. speak Russian. Uh, Trump does not speak English uh, either, just so we're clear. Yeah. The White House had previously stupid. said we, when they back when they were lying about it and hadn't been caught yet that the meeting was one of several informal talks. But they didn't disclose that Trump did not have any official members of his team present at the talk. Yeah, the only way we heard about this was Russian news. Mm-hmm. And really, if you want to if you want to talk over Trump's head, just use big words. You don't have to speak Russian or <laughs> just, French or uh, German. Well, just he use, speaks at just use, a fourth grade. He this is this yeah. is official. He speaks at a fourth grade level, and yes. uh, that is not a bad thing if you're a politician to speak at a reasonable level of understanding. Uh, you know, there are people who argue that speaking at eleventh grade level really leaves out a lot of the American pop- populace. And Mm -hmm. uh, I am all for not talking down to people, but speaking in a language that people can understand and making sure you communicate your values in a way that people get it. But uh, no, Trump is just dumb. And that's Mm -hmm. what is going on there. And and this story, um, this was on the Rachel Maddow show last night, and I didn't understand it, honestly, until she landed the plane and explained it. Uh, Russians have leaked more than a thousand files from Robert Mueller's office sharing confidential, which were shared confidentially with indicted Russian hackers in an attempt to discredit the investigation. Uh, According to the Mueller cult court filing, the names and structures of folders containing the leaked files match those used by special counsel's office when it shared data with Concord management. So here's the, here's the longer version of that short story. Um, uh, They've, they've indicted a whole bunch of Russians. Of course, Russians live in Russia. They're never coming here. The Russians allowed their, front organization, Concord Concord Management, to be deposed. The reason they did this was because during deposition, you get discovery. And the reason, and and during discovery, you have to share all of the information that you're going to bring to trial. Prosecutors have to do that. That gave them the opportunity to take all of those files, which are supposed to remain secret, leak them back to Russia, where they could be doctored and leaked back into the internet as evidence of the investigation being horrible. Entirely uh, an espionage mm-hmm. um, trick entirely set up to and and the problem was of course that the guys on the good guys spotted it immediately and said, oh this is what happened they deliberately sacrificed a pawn to get access to files they could doctor and use to try to discredit the entire investigation and it failed but that's how important it is to russia that this investigation not be taken seriously by republicans by americans mm-hmm. Uh, because it's getting very, very close to the time when you start having to say Russia declared war on us. Right. And the first thing they captured was the White House. And we have to start treating it like an act of war. And we have to start treating the White House like occupied territory. And that is a very scary thought for most Americans to have. The NRA claims they played no official role in a December 2015 trip to Moscow to meet with Russian nationals, despite mm-hmm. internal NRA emails and photos showing that the organization was significantly involved in the planning yeah. of this trip. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this last story is one of those things that went under the radar a little bit, but is really kind of important because Trump's golf course in New York relied on dozens of undocumented workers while Trump was demanding border wall funding during the shutdown. And I did cut out three uh, quotes from the news if you want to read them or not. But the, the point being, Trump organization has not only employed dozens of undocumented workers for years, sometimes decades, but assisted them in getting the proper fake documentation that would pass muster internally so they could be hired. The Trump organization knew all about this shit that was going on, perfectly okay with it because they could pay them less, they could treat them badly, and they could use them like most American companies use undocumented workers as cheap labor so they wouldn't have to pay people who are properly documented or Americans actual living wages. And then they got caught. And it's not just any organization that got caught. It's Mr. Build me a fucking wang doodle so we can keep these people out of the country guy who got caught using illegal undocumented workers on purpose as part of a corporate strategy to rip off the American people. Well, and I'm old enough to remember when two Clinton appointees were ripped out of contention because they had hired one undocumented nanny apiece. Yes. Donald Trump has hired multiple, multiple undocumented people through his hotels because yes. that's what hotels do. Let's yeah. face it. People that change the linens in your hotel are often undocumented. Yes. And hotels take advantage of them. 
in order to lower uh, costs of employment. That's not a surprise. No. Uh, this is something that uh, Donald Trump should have cleaned up before he ran for president. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of things he thought he could get away with. Uh, right, because he never thought he was going to win. <laughs> he, he never thought, thought he was, was going to win, and uh, he was going to use this to launch a, you know, improve his brand overall. Right. You, you get a, uh, a show on Fox. He would cripple. He would help Russians cripple the yeah. Hillary Clinton presidency out of the gate. Right. And he would collect his reward at the other end with a Trump Tower in Moscow. Right. Right. That's that was the plan. That was the, that's the plan. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is Wrangle. Hello, Wrangle. Wrangle loves to go outside. Wants to go outside. Let's go outside. And Wrangle is a beautiful kitty. Wrangle's belly is showing off on the picture. He's she's mm -hmm. trying to go through the window because she wants to go outside. Uh, those of you like us who were affected by uh, the polar vortex this week, <laughs> don't lose your minds just because it's 50 degrees on Sunday. Yeah. We know for a fact that Wrangle will be going outside. Now, this isn't Charlie Wrangle, is it? Because no, Charlie Wrangle. This is Wrangle, W R A N G L E. Uh, I see, I see. Yeah. At Wrangle, that yes. cat. Yep. I, any excuse to do my Charlie Wrangle, <laughs> uh, I will take. <laughs> you can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, prolefpodcast at gmail.com where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. As you can tell, we love hearing from you. Be aware if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. And Drift Glass, we are at now at that point of the year where we are hearing, I've heard from two people this week to say, I will be sending you my annual dues, as they call it. One of them oh. called it annual dues, which is really oh. sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as my income tax refund comes. And sure. there are a number of people who send us the equivalent of $5 a month when their income tax comes, or the $10 a month when their income tax return, their refund comes. They take a part of that big chunk of money that they get and send it, send it to support the podcast. No problem. Whenever that happens, we're grateful. We don't keep track or, you know, cut you off or anything. We're not oh. we're not here to keep track of donations that way, but uh, we love you for your support of the show. Thank you. Don't forget, this is not charity. This is our job. So don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline if you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself. Buy one for us. Approximately one half of 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. We have lots of opportunities for you to, via PayPal or Patreon or buy me a coffee or buy some merch. Uh, we have Both Sides Don't t-shirts for sale there. Uh, and our postal address information is there if you just want to mail us a check. That's fine too. All of that information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties agree humans are a valuable source of heat during the winter months. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.